So uh, welcome to our sim uh, launch for our new Simplify Sign, um, a manual sign of communication system for a special population book, um, which was written by the late John D. Van Villian, uh, by Nicole kissan Lee, who is here with us today, Tracy T. Dooley and Philip Long, who is also here with us today. Uh, so we have a book publishers that are really fortunate to have with us today uh, for this book launch, these three panelists. Um, first, we have uh, Bill Van Villian, um, who you will uh, really soon meet, and is here presenting in, uh, in behalf of his brother, the late John D. Van Villian. Um, John D. Vermillion was the principal author of this book. Uh, he was a faculty member of the psychology department at the University of Virginia. Uh, he was working there for 37 years. And he also chaired the university interdepartmental inter program in linguistics. Vermillion was known for his contribution to the study of sign language, ch child development, psycholinguistics, and language acquisition. And for the last 17 years of his career, he worked on developing the simplified science system that is the subject of our discussion today. Uh, he also received his PhD in psychology from Stanford University and his uh, BA in psychology from Job Hopkins. He authored uh, around 100 journal articles and he was an editor of, of the journal Sign Language Studies. Um, he sadly passed away in 2018, that's the reason why we have Bill with us today. Uh, we also have to, uh, in our panel, uh, Nicole Kisan Lee. Uh, so she had the privilege of formally starting the Simplified Sign Project uh, with Dr. Uh, John Bambillion in 1997. Uh, back then, she was the first year pre-medical student at the University of Virginia. Uh, she, after that, graduated in 2001 with high distinction in psychology and under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Von Villian as well, uh, with her thesis uh, focused on the Simplified Sign Project. Uh, this project gained recognition for its unique innovation and was uh, showcased in the Today Show, the CNN, the Washington Post and Cosmogol, um, to name a few. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, afterwards went on to obtain her medical degree from the Medical College in Virginia and her surgical residency training at the University of Florida. She also had a fellowship training in advanced laparoscopic surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, after that, uh, she had a, fel a fellowship training in medical uh, simulation from Brigham and Women's Hospital and she obtained a her, ma her Master of Education with a focus on technology and innovation from the bariatric surgeon at, at Indiana University. She is now an assistant professor of surgery and director of the Indiana University Surgical Skills Center and also co-director of the Indiana University Sur Surgical Education Research Fellowship. Uh, finally, we have Philip Long. Uh, so he's a, psych a psycholinguist from Belgium who came to the United States in 1997 um, as a professor of the Carey School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. Uh, before his arrival in the US, he worked for 20 years as educational psychologist and as a school superintendent for services for children with disabilities. He obtained, he obtained his BA and MA degrees um, in special education from the University of Ghent and her master's degree and PhD in neurolinguistics uh, from the University of Brussels. While he was in Belgium, he was a co-developer of a manual sign system that is actually currently in use in part of Europe and since his arrival in the US in the late 90s. Uh, until Dr. Pavilion's passing, he collaborated with him on several research projects related to the simplified sign system. So this is a project that has been going on for a long time. Um, and we we'll also have some of the contributors that are not able to be here with us today. Uh, this is uh, Tracy T. Dooley, uh, the, one that I, the person I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so she was an undergraduate honors student at the University of Virginia and a member of Dr. Vermillion's research group in the early 90s. Uh, she there studied handed nursing within the young sign learning children of their parents. Uh, Dooley later obtained her Master of Divinity uh, from the Emory University. Uh, at the Cantler School of Theology and Percy training in sign language interpretation at the Cobb College. In 2003, Dooley rejoined Dr. Rubilia's research group uh, where she focused on the expansion of simplified science system to include more concepts, the writing and editing of volumes one and two and overseeing the development of sign illustrations. After Dr. Vermillion passed away, uh, Mrs. Dooley updated both, of, uh, both volumes of, the, of this uh, book and uh, he prepared the system uh, uh, and the, the different ideas uh, to be ready for publication. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Val Nelson Medley, um, who illustrated the simplified signs. Uh, so uh, Nelson Medley was born uh, hard of hearing and is now deaf and fluent um, in, uh, in American Sign Language. She graduated from the University of Kansas and then she went to work as a commercial artist and she has kindly worked on all the signs that you can actually see on her new edited volumes that I think everyone had the chance to access or um, yeah, we send the, the link and everything. So I hope you have familiarized yourself with uh, this fantastic volume. Uh, so before beginning with the questions to your panelists, um, as I've said before, I want to explain a few logistics for the Zoom call. So this event is being recorded. Uh, so to maintain your privacy and make sure that um, you are um, as comfortable as possible, 
I would recommend you to turn off your camera. Um, the microphones are already turned off uh, for everyone. So if you have any questions, as I've said before, please put it on the chat, Peter. And um, I would also like to let you know that if there is anything, any problem or your experiment is some issues with uh, perhaps any of the people who are intervening that you can hear well enough, just as well, just put it on the chat, Peter, and I, I will make sure I transmit the message to, to everyone. Um, so if uh, everything, uh, oh, sorry, I just got a message. I'll slow down. <laughs> so um, if everything is okay, I will just continue with the first question. So this question is for panel member, Nicole Kisanli, who I understand, and as I've mentioned before, was there at the inception of the Simplified Sign Project. Um, it was some 20 years, some, around some 20 years ago. So would you like to tell us a bit about the Simplified Sign Project and what it is and how did it come about? Yes. Um, good morning and thank you. Can everyone hear me? So I'm, I'm Nicole Kassane Lee. Nice to see everybody this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, the Simplified Sign Project was the brilliant brainchild of my mentor, um, Professor John Bonvillian. Bill Bonvillian, his brother, will speak more about John in a minute. So I'm, I'm not going to... Um, take all of his thunder and take all the details about his, his wonderful brother. But um, Professor Von Billion, John Von Billion, was one of my first professors at the University of Virginia when I was an undergraduate in 1997. Professor John Von Billion taught an undergraduate course called Child Psychology. It was extremely popular and always packed. There was waiting lists every single time he taught it. Fortunately, I got in. Um, one day after class, I approached Professor Von Billion and asked if he had any potential research endeavors that I could participate in. As an enthusiastic, budding pre-medical student, I knew I wanted to and needed to participate in research as an undergraduate, and I was most interested in the research and opportunities that Professor Von Billion discussed in his class. He was really captivating. Lo and behold, he had been contemplating a simplified sign system for hearing but non-speaking populations for many years, something that had just been rumbling around in his brain. It was a tremendous undertaking that he knew would take years to bring to fruition, but he seemed to think that with somebody that was, I was a freshman in college, so I had four years of, of work ahead of me, and it was perfect timing for him and I to work together to truly launch this simplified sign system. Over the next four years, we worked diligently to bring the project from just an idea in his head to a formal system available on the web. Our project was so popular on the web back in 2001 that we nearly crashed the University of Virginia's website. At the end of uh, at the middle of 2001 and the end of the at the end of this first chapter of the Simplified Sign Project and all of this web excitement. We gained national and international recognition with major news sources highlighting our research and catapulting this project to the next realm, which is where my partners on this call have taken it. The University of Virginia had put out a press release about our interesting and novel research and they were very proud of Dr. Bonvillian and his graduating student. Before we knew it, CNN, the Today Show, the Today Show actually came to the University of Virginia and followed us around. The Washington Post and even a magazine called Cosmo Girl were calling us to get access to our work. It was an exciting time and I was so privileged to be part of it. I'm still privileged to be part of it. It's, it's, it's probably the single most important time in my life that launched my career in medicine, my career in research. Um, I'm still an active researcher and I think that Dr. Um, Von Villian was the, was the pivotal point that really launched me there. So. That's the very beginning of this, this whole endeavor. Um, maybe not the beginning, the beginning began in his brain, but this is when the pen hit the paper and then ultimately hit the web and the rest is history. Well, thank you so much uh, for that. So we're going to the next question. So the next question is for Bill Von Billion. Uh, so I understand that the Simplified Science Projects was a capstone project for your brother, John Von Billion's career. Uh, so, would you like to tell us a bit about your brother, Jan, um, his career, interests, and research, and how that culminated into the Simplified Sign Projects? Uh, sorry, uh, we can't hear you, so if you could please, Bill, be careful with that. Thank you. Sorry, thanks. Thanks, Laura. And it's hard to beat what Nicole said, but uh, let me just add a few, a few points here and a few perspectives. Um, you know, my brother, 
got his BA in psychology from Johns Hopkins. And, you know, that's probably the place where he first developed you know, his interest in language and cognition, you know, really about how we, how we learn, how we know things. I um, mean, he went on to get his PhD in psychology at Stanford. And it's there really that he became interested in sign language. He worked with Penny Patterson and the gorilla Coco. Uh, and the two of them worked on teaching this gorilla signs and Coco eventually got up to probably over 600 signs, which was a fascinating story. Uh, but he also, for example, he had, had an experience working with a young boy uh, who had severe autism. Um, and he had the idea of teaching him some basic signs. And the child had never been able to communicate with his parents. And he was able to do that for the first time through a few signs. So, you know, even early on in his career, these ideas were, were floating around. Uh, after his first teaching job, he moved to the University of Virginia where he spent the rest of his career and he retired emeritus from UVA in 2015. He always taught the large introductory first year lecture course year after year, as, as uh, Nikki has just reminded us. But he used that, as Nikki experienced, as kind of a testing ground for his emerging science system. Um, throughout his career, he took an interest in sign language, first developed at Stanford, and applied it not to gorillas, but to the human species. His research focused on how, how people <clears throat> learn spoken language. You know, are there cognitive advantages to signing? How does signing fit with other ideas about linguistics and cognitive development? One feature of John's work was his very early support of sign language to communicate with nonverbal populations, as I mentioned, including some children with autism. And that led him eventually to a very prescient educator named Gail Mayfield, who taught, helped lead the Grafton School in Virginia for people with disabilities. And Gail asked John to develop a simplified signing system for her students who had difficulty communicating effectively in the American Sign Language, which is the sign language uh, for the deaf here in the United States. And John had been thinking about this, but that gave him a push. So the project took the last 20 years of my brother's life and his career, and it was truly a labor of love. So as you've heard, um, it involved finding, developing, testing hand signs that would be both easy to form and easy to remember. And that brings us to where we are today and the publication of these two volumes of simplified signs, which, as you noted, Laura, uh, was certainly my brother's capstone project, but also a great accomplishment for the other three authors. Well, thank you so much for that, Phil. Uh, so we're going on to the next question. So the next question is for Philip Blanc. Um, so he brings up uh, the Simplifying Sign project, both a theoretical focus on linguistics and a practical focus on teaching children with special needs. So this question will be aimed at the theoretical side of things. So can you explain to our audience a little bit about the development of an appreciation uh, for sign language from a linguistics perspective? Yes, thank you for the question. But first, let me say, uh, Laura and everybody, I see that there are a few people in the audience that I know. So hello to everybody. Um, good to see you, uh, Ludwina and, and, and Ingrid and Kristen and others. And Nick, Nick, uh, Nicola, oh, um, good to see you. Um, my uh, connection, I met actually John in the summer of 1981. To tell you a little bit about, about our age in, in Bristol, England. So it's, yeah, this summer it was 39 years ago. It was the, the, the same time, or it was a week before the, uh, the famous wedding of Princess Di with, uh, and, uh, and the rest of the story you probably know. Anyway, I was, I was immediately interested in the work that he presented at a, at a conference in Bristol, um, which was emerging about, it was a, a conference about sign language, sign language research, which was, has been then maybe for 10 years about an emerging field in linguistics and in psycholinguistics. And, and he presented this research, and I was personally very interested in that because it emerged a couple of things. For example, his interest in developmental psychology, Piaget, what I, what I shared with him. So I was very much interested in, in that. Um, and 
we I, I started, that was before we had emails that I started to have some old fashioned letter writing exchange with, with him. I lived in Belgium. Um, and um, in that period, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, I was involved in an, an, a project that is still existing in Belgium and in other parts of Europe where we have de developed also a science system. Not quite exactly this, the way in simplified science work, but there are some similarities. And that was also going on in other places. It's really based on, and to go, actually to go to your question, what has that to do with sign language research and sign, sign language linguistics? Well, the big discovery of sign language linguistics was that sign languages are languages. I mean, it's very trivial today, but back in 1981 and, and certainly before that, that was almost controversial. Many people believe that hey, the, the, the basis of um, of language is the acoustic signal, the sound. So by definition, if you take that narrow view, what we now think as a narrow view, if you take that narrow view, then by definition, sign languages are not languages. Uh, but what sign language research showed was, and, and that has also been, been influenced by other development in, in linguistics, it's really the symbol that counts. The fact that there is a symbol that is conventionalized and all that. So that has, shown that, that not only sign languages or linguistic systems or languages, but also that the signs themselves are linguistic units. So, and this is of course something we accept now and, and, we, and, every, and nobody questions that anymore, but it really very demonstrates that the linguistic potential is very flexible. You don't have to use it in, in, an, in an acoustic, and in an acoustic signal. And that has been shown in, in deaf communities around the world since, since the creation of the world, basically. As soon as there were deaf communities, there were sign languages. Only people didn't know there were, that these were sign languages. Um, and what, we, when, what people more and more realized is that deaf communities had discovered that, that there is an alternative for the acoustic signal for spoke, uh, spoken languages. And so the next step in, in thinking was, maybe not everybody will discover that on their own because people are not in, in communities, maybe individuals with, with, with autism or other developmental uh, 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 disabilities. Maybe we can actually extract some of these symbols that seem to work for so in a natural way for uh, as an alternative in deaf communities. We can extract that and somehow offer them to other populations. So that's really how the discovery of sign, lang sign languages, sign linguistics connects with the project that uh, John started uh, with the Simplified Signs. Well, thank you so much for that, Philip. Uh, so now I want to do like a proof of stuff and I want to like have some fun with the, the audience as well. So I was wondering whether someone in the panel would have to demonstrate a few of the signs for us, the respondent here. I'm happy to volunteer. Um, my, personal, my personal favorite sign is peak, mostly because that's the sign that was on the front page of the Washington Post back in um, 2001. But I also like my medical signs and um, John Von Billion put a, a specific effort to put a lot of medical signs into, into this project because of the target population of people that have medical needs. So I like doctor, which is, let me get it on my screen, this. Heart attack, my, my husband's a heart surgeon, so I know heart attack quite well. Oxygen tubes, my, my three-year-old might think that's more than oxygen tubes, but um, I don't know. Pain, and then the all for, the one everyone's scared of, shot. So those are, the, I like the medical ones and like to share those, and I've taught those actually just to my kids. Well, that's fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, so I've got a few, Laura. A few, oh, yes, forward. please. Sure. Go ahead. One of my favorites is turtle. My brother used to entertain us sometimes at dinners with his favorite emerging signs. One of my all-time favorites is squid. And, you know, this is squirrel and bird, obviously. Um, 
And, you know, Caterpillar I've always liked as well. So those are a few of some of my favorite signs. And again, they're designed to be easy to use, but also very easy to remember so that it truly is a simplified signing system. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, so as much as I would like to continue with the sign demonstrations, I do have more questions for the panel. So I will go over the next one with um, one for Philip Long. Uh, so Philip, uh, um, yeah, so it goes um, about the practical application of the simplified signs. So would you like to tell us your experience with the special populations and their use of the signing in general and the simplified signs in particular? Yeah, so my, per thank you for, for the question. Yeah, my personal experience is, and um, let's say, and this goes back really even before I, I have met John, maybe in the beginning, the time that I met John is when at several places in the world, including where, where I lived at that time, people started to try out um, manual signs with special, quote, special populations, individuals with whom, let's say the traditional forms of speech therapy or speech intervention did not, uh, did not work. And so, and um, anecdotal, eh? and it, it started really with case to this anecdotal evidence is that it often worked, eh? that these kids or these, uh, it's usually people started with teenagers after, uh, after a while, people had tried to, to teach them to, to speak and it didn't work. And so, and then after, uh, when these kids were 12, 13, 14 years old, people, they threw up their arms and say, well, this is not working. Just after all, let's do something something different and so um so signing was started and little by little uh, people published reports i did i was one of those and, and uh, several others uh, published reports about uh, the case studies about one case two cases little groups people started to uh, to organize it it's better and to put it uh, to summarize the research or the reports is it seemed to work and then there's another di discussion about why actually does it work uh, but the reason why it works, I mean, I believe in the very simple reason I do, why it works is that you offer something that has a number of, let's say, entry points where that can, um, that make it, makes it learnable through which communication works. So it's a visual thing, it's a gestural thing and, and all that. And it's often um, um, embedded in interaction. And before I uh, let me explain that in a minute. So um, I didn't give you my favorite signs yet. Okay, the reason is that um, I think the most my favorite signs or the best signs are I think are the ones that actually are interactive. Things like thank you or I give to you or buy things that are really based in normal interactions. And and, and so and because these normal interactions and that you um, um, that you reinforce with signs, with something that people can understand, can can actually internalize and build a symbol in their head. This is a basis for many other things. It has a basis really for socialization, for cognitive development, um, um, and and for learning in, in general. So, and what is what happens is, and it has been reported again and again, is that you create by opening something you create a dynamic that other that um, learning can um, expand and one more thing about the about experiences in most cases um, in in educational situations or in, in other situations not just in schools or something um, the practice that is in some form or other generally promoted and used is what is called keyword signing. So it's not that you just sign, because that's, that's a complicated thing, it's not sign language, uh, but you're going to um, use it in a multimodal way. You're going to still have eye contact, talk to a person. In other words, you present your, your communication partner with an, an, a number of information, a number of channels that in, for, in which Probably for many of them, the sign is the most pre prevalent one, the most the, the the strongest one. So that is called keyword signing. So you you say to educators or parents or or uh, to communicate with the person who would benefit from the uh, the signs, keep talking to the person in a specific way and really highlight 
eh, the, the core words, the, the keywords with, with manual signs. And that's a practice that's now used in some flexible form in many places now. Well, thank you so much, Philip. Uh, so my last question would be for Bill Pavilion. So Bill, um, will you describe to us the structure of the two volumes that comprises the Simplified Science Project and how the public can obtain access to the science and how they can learn it? Sorry, we can hear you, Bill. Laura, as you know, um, there are two volumes here. And, you know, as we discussed about my, from earlier descriptions of my brother, John, he, he was an academic and he was interested in kind of all aspects of signing. Uh, so the first volume of Simplified Science really is an academic summary of the research and the history of signing. And while this volume is academically very rigorous, and I can say fairly exhaustive at points, it's also remarkably accessible to those of us who don't have a background in psychology or linguistics. So volume one is, is both a compendium of the research about sign language uh, usage and, 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 and its various contexts, and it's a platform for understanding the Simplified Science Project. So I think most readers are gonna find it fascinating. It covers issues like, you know, did humans sign before they had a spoken language? Uh, why did Native Americans, you know, make such widespread use of a common sign language that the tribes had in common? Uh, did early European explorers use sign language? Uh, could signing help and how in language acquisition? That's volume one, which is a, just a very rich history and analysis that's quite accessible. Volume two, volume two is designed to stand alone. It is the lexicon. And in it, uh, with Val Medley Nelson's 1,000 drawings, are 1,000 of the 1,800 signs that the project developed. The lexicon includes illustrations of each sign and verbal descriptions of the sign and memory aids and synonyms for each sign. The volume includes, importantly, a dynamic index of the signs, which is a tremendous tool for finding just the right sign to fit your needs. Simplified Signs was published by Open Book Publishers, which is sponsoring, of course, this book launch. Open Book makes all of its books available online free. It is open access. So hardback, paperback, ebook copies are also available for a fee, but the system is there for you to use. And it was important to John and the other authors that this be available to everyone. Um, and th open, publishing through open book really, really makes that possible. So please spread the word about it. I think one more thing deserves mention. The signs are easy to learn. They're fun. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that, um, that others, I know some of my family are already considering this, are going to be preparing tutorials to help teach the signs to people who want to learn them. So watch for tutorials upcoming on YouTube and particularly on this open, open book website. Well, thank you so much for that, Bill. Uh, so we do have a few, a few questions already. Um, so I will go through them. And uh, in the meantime, please feel free to send the questions. You can send them either to me directly or to the general channel for everyone to see. Uh, so uh, I will start with the first. So we do have um, from Nicola, we have a um, question slash observation. Uh, so she talks about how keyword signs work in practice. So a plea really for learning from the individuals who are using sign creatively and spontaneously in ways that we don't really predict. So that was a bit of her statement. Do you have anything that you would like to add or you would like to comment upon? Hello. It, it looks like someone's talking, but not unmuted. Miss Grove. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nikki. It looks like Nicola Grove is talking, but not, but not unmuted. I don't know if she's trying to, um, Laura, if you want to activate her account. Oh, yes. Uh, so just.
Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to say it's such a privilege to be here because um, uh, I'm an old colleague of Philip's and of John's himself and one of the last things John did was to uh, contribute a chapter to the book I published last year which is a um, account of sign acquisition in children with developmental disabilities both deaf and hearing and it was really wonderful to have that communication with him so to see simplified signs taking off in the states where um, uh, I think that I know as a speech therapist there hasn't been quite enough um, in pedagogy and quite enough acceptance of signing and signing children is really wonderful and I'm so hoping that this project is going to really persuade speech, speech pathologists and teachers to take off with signing. So um, my observation is, is really, it's a kind of plea for saying that it's not just about teaching uh, these children and adults to sign. It's us learning from them because what my PhD showed is that although we may be using keyword signing to children, they often surprise us by the way that they communicate back. And often these kids will do things like use signing in a different word order and they will modify signs um, to create spontaneous meanings. So for example, the sign give, give to you, even if they're not taught, they will change the handshape to show if they're giving a cup or they're giving a sweet. And this is something very surprising and means that what we really need to do is make sure that whatever form of sign we're teaching, we're very alert to the linguistic innovations that these young people are making. And I'd love some comments from the panel on that. Um, I think that's for me. First, Nicola, it's great to see you. Um, yeah, and um, yes, um, I, yes, I agree with you. Um, so um, just a few minutes ago, Bill, mentioned that we will put we will put up tutorials and and so and i can ma imagine that some of the tutorials will exactly be about that okay um to uh, to raise awareness about people who want to adopt it and use it R raise awareness that it's not a one-way stream like we are the teachers and we give that to you and do what we would tell you uh, the uh, the signs that are suggested uh, that are in the, in, the, in the system are ones that were, were found to be probably very accessible. That, but that doesn't mean that it's sometimes divine law that every person will have to use it. In fact, as it always happens, as you enter in an interactive learning process, and the, let's say the teacher or the adult or the, uh, the caregiver or whoever the person is, or the communication partner with, uh, with the person who can benefit from um, um, the, uh, the, the, the signs, and the magic will happen. I mean, the, we think will happen, and it's like a negotiation process. Some signs will be adopted, some signs may not be adopted, some signs will be modified. And at the same time, yes, it's a, good, it's a great suggestion to, in our tutorial, to actually to, um, to make people who want to introduce it and, and use it, to make them aware of the fact that they need to be observers, and they are not just teachers, they are also students from the person that they are teaching. So I thank you for thank you for your comment. It, that's a great addition. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, as I was saying before, like please do feel free to send me um, all your questions um, either privately through the or to the uh, general channel. If someone wants to intervene as well and is okay with it being recorded and um, them talking, I can also activate your microphone. So please let me know. We do have uh, some more questions. Um, so one from Ralph uh, to see you. So I just want to. So there is two of them, so I will go for the, with the first one. So um, can you give us some example of a sign that is too complex to understand and the replacement uh, that Simplify Science Project has presented for it? Hello? Philippe, do you know of a sign that was very complex in, in American Sign Language or in another sign language system that we simplified quite radically? In, instead of turning on my microphone, I turned it off. So, but no, I don't know from the top of my head. I remember that we had many discussions 
about when would we we will decide or it is it is too hard. So we, uh, the uh, we didn't see anything about that. The methodology that John used you know, for for all the signs, I, I believe, is that he he kind of tested them and how the, the learnability. And so some some signs were clearly too complicated and were replaced by by another one. Um, but I don't have an example from the top of my head which which one. It's really a number of things. Is the so a number of criteria are, are used in general. Is it something that is easy to recognize? Sometimes it's called iconicity or transparency. Another thing is, is it easy to produce? Okay. Or is it simple? But simple, I mean, some signs seem to be combination of other signs, like a compound, uh, a com they call it a compound signs. So those are, and that was shown also in the research that for they were, most of them were tested on quote naive learners, people who didn't know anything, and and so and those of one were they they were um, uh, re rejected. Um, so sorry, I did not really answer the question because I didn't have the answer, but I given as a politician, I gave an answer, not a different answer. Um, I actually got a tip from a, a, a old friend from UVA. Um, I love you is in ASL. That's extremely hard. Um, so thank you, Jess Davis, for, for telling me that one. And we've actually transformed that to, I love you, is you know, kind of crossing your arms across your chest. And so this would be way too hard to do um, for some populations. So that was a, that's a transition that we made. I can't take credit for it. I, I'm getting help from the audience. <laughs> thank you so much for that, uh, to both of you. So the second question that Ralph has posed um, is, um, can you show us what the book looks like covering inside pages? I think we actually have uh, the person in charge of production of a book in here. So, um, yeah, so we, uh, Nick, I think you had a copy of it, if someone has in the office, that's, yeah. So here's, here's volume one with my UVA colors. I'm very happy about that. And it's, it's just a traditional book, um, well-written, of course, and John spent decades making it perfect. Here's the uh, lexicon, and our illustrations are marvelous, so, with a nice description next to every one. Very easy to read, a ton of work by my partners on this call. Heavy, could do some damage. <laughs> you know, I can, I can I add something here at this point, uh, Laura. Yes. Um, about how to use this, right? How do you make use of these books, whether online or, or, uh, or hardback? Um, you know, I'd start by reminding everyone that this, in this simplified science system, it's not a full language like the American Sign Language. It's a simplified system. One sign can cover many related concepts or words. So, you know, for example, the sign for music is this. But that also can cover song, instrument, orchestra, singing. So when you use this material, don't just look up a specific word. Use the sign index that's in volume two. So if you look up the word symphony, for example, the index is going to tell you to look up music, right? And music is what we call a gloss word. And it will be bolded in the index. And when you find and check on music in the online version of the index, it will take you directly to the, to the sign for music in the lexicon itself, right? So my first answer really on how to use this is use the index tool to find what you want. Because I think you'll find that the index and the sign system really are remarkably comprehensive. And there's also kind of a second answer which is there really is no sign from, if there's no sign that you know, fully covers the concept that you want, create one. And you know, if it works for you, share it. Because my brother wanted, and I know the other authors do too, they wanted the simplified sign system to be very useful and to grow and to develop. So you know, just as an example, my wife has already created a sign to name herself. And she'll use it, I think, on the signing tutorials that she's working on. But the sign for herself consists of the sign for celebrate, right? And it's celebrate, and she brings it down to herself, right? And, you know, it's one she particularly likes. And 
it's it's fun to use and you can be creative in combining these different uh, different ideas and concepts well thank you so much for that bill uh so now that we've talked about like how the physical book is we do have a question from the person turret to production who's a subset here today with us so um, he would be interested in knowing more about the genesis of design as in like, how do you come up with design? Uh, does design go through a process of reiteration or redefinition? I can comment on that a little bit. Um, John Von Billion had tremendous experience with, I mean, we must have had 40 books of different sign languages from across the world. And he would peruse these and find ones that he thought were pantomimic and easy to learn and that they just conceptually made a lot of sense and we tested them on undergraduate students um, for memory and recall of these signs. So that was back in the early days of it how we kind of we just went through dictionary after dictionary after dictionary and picked ones that we thought were helpful and that launched the first probably 500 signs. They got revised over the years, they get added on to and I think there was some um, creative um, additions, like um, like Bill says, where ones that just kind of made sense or what were appropriate. So it all, everything was rooted originally in multiple dictionaries and, and literature based, and they were just adapted, but they were all tested on it. We had a pretty extensive memory and recall of signs as kind of the, the platform research. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so um, I get another question from Michael Orlansky. So what percentage roughly of the simplified signs are drawn from standard American Sign Language? And what were the criteria for modifying the American Sign Language or devising new ones for the simplified sign pro uh, program? Yeah, so John had really a very, um, let's say, practical approach to that. So um, because of American Sign Language is here in, in, in America, the most available and most accessible uh, sign language, that's really where we looked first, or where he looked, uh, where, where he looked first. And, but then it's not, and, but that's not a priority, that's really, um, but just the fact that it's, it's there. Now, ASL, as a, American Sign Language, and as any other sign language is, is a language that is used by individuals who have all normal skills, ling normal linguistic skills, con con um, uh, cognitive skills. So some of them may not be um, acceptable. And then we actually, then we move to the other, to other things. So sometimes um, one, uh, one thing that was, that was done was actually to modify the ASL sign instead of going somewhere else, really modify the ASL sign. For example, and, and actually Ingrid Verbank, who is in the audience, sent, uh, just texted me and, and a suggestion. Some of the ASL signs contain uh, the a form of finger spelling, really the, the initial letter of the, of the word. Now, that requires, okay, or, or to make it easier to learn, requires some knowledge, some understanding of, of spelling, of, 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 and some, some level of literacy. That is helpful for many learners, but sometimes not for the typical learners that we think of for um, in our um, in, in our population. So if modif modifying ASL signs is not an, an option for uh, then, uh, as as Nikki just said, uh, um, we went to other uh, or John went to other uh, other sources. So um, so we have, but I don't know the answer of the of the question. Maybe that maybe that should be an interesting research project. How many of the of the signs are still intact, untouched, or um, ASL signs, and, and how many are not. Well, thank you I so much. If I could add something to that, um, which is another source um, that fascinated my brother, was uh, the Native American Sign Languages in North America. And, and it was a single language. So there were a thousand spoken languages for Native American tribes across across the North America, but there was a single common sign language, uh, which is fascinating. And it, the, the signs in this Amer Native American signing were very iconic. Uh, they looked like what they meant. And that was a key, as Philip has pointed out, and Nikki has pointed out, in adopting the signs uh, for this simplified signing system. So. I think something resembling 20% or so of the signs that they adopted were from Native American Sign Language. 
Thank you so much for that, Phil. Uh, so we have a few questions. Uh, if you're remembering my first email to contacting you about um, your sign up to the event, uh, we did uh, put a, doc, um, a, a Google Doc form uh, so that you can send our questions to us before uh, the launch. So I have a few of those. Um, so I will go through them if that's okay. So one of them was, um, do you believe that simplified science will replace the sign languages used by deaf people nowadays or at the moment? Or Yeah, I can, I can comment on that. Um, the simplified you. science is meant to be an aid or an adjunct to populations trying to communicate. It's not supposed to replace a language. Um, you know, we want this to be easy to learn, easy to remember. And if it was trying to replace a language, everybody knows how long it takes to learn a language. So it's, it's, an, it's an adjunct, it's an aid, it's a tool, um, but it's not meant to replace a language. And I can add to that too, Nikki. Um, you know, my brother John had the highest regard for the deaf community and their sign language. Uh, and he studied and he used ASL, you know, pretty extensively. He spent a wonderful sabbatical learning year at Gallaudet University, which is the US University for the Deaf. Um, and he, you know, he had many, many, many contacts and both social and professional in the deaf community. So the furthest thing from, and from his mind, and I know of the other authors too, was in any way attempting to replace ASL. ASL is a full, rich, deep, complex language. This is a simplified system, right? This is a much more basic communication system for those who can access ASL, right? Um, so this is not, this is not replacing ASL. This is an adjunct, as Nikki just pointed out. This is a supplemental piece in a way to help people in special populations that really need help in, in communication. Uh, but you know, it can be used for other purposes too, potentially, again, in this simple kind of way. You know, baby speak, right? There's been a lot of literature on baby speak, and a lot of these simple signs are available to really little children to learn pretty quickly. Nikki just mentioned that she's taught a number to her kids. Um, learning a foreign language, it may be, and this is one of the things my brother was exploring later in his life, it may be that learning a sign along with the foreign language word is a way of enhancing and helping recall for the new foreign language word that you're trying to acquire. So there's all kinds of potential uses out here that, uh, that this might actually fit. One of the other things that um, John and I had had a goal on, and I think that's continued throughout the entire project, is that if there was some a person learning this in somewhat of a crisis situation, a new a new physical ailment, they needed to be able to learn this rapidly. That a person with you know could could focus and learn a lot of signs and be able to you know present a lot of signs to another person within a short amount of time. They could learn a lot on a weekend. They could learn a lot in a week, and um, you know, you can't do that with a language, but you can do that with a, with a system. Well, thank you so much. We have uh, another one, which is um, kind of related to um, other that was submitted to us. So what would people or should people do if they cannot find a sign that they need? And also related to this question, are there going to be any tutorials or tools that can help someone learn the language and learn the use of simplified signs? Well, you know, I can build Laura on my prior answer, which is really use the index, right? Because again, the signing system will have these gloss words. I mean, think about the word glossary, right? It'll have these basic words that can cover lots of different meanings, and the meaning will be derived from the context in which, in which you're speaking. Uh, so use the index a lot, and in the online version, that in turn links you immediately, right? You just highlight it. Uh, right to the actual signing and to the gloss word. So, you know, as I said, symphony, singing is also music, right? And that will take you right to music. So that will help you kind of flesh out uh, what you need to get. But there's also room for creativity, right? So you could combine, for example, the word, you know, music with group, and that seems to suggest symphony for example. So there are a lot of ways to kind of tackle this. Again, it's, it's a simple system, but there are ways to use it creatively, I think can work to fill in gaps. Yeah, if I can add something to that. So 
creativity is, I think, is, is really the key. So what you have is you have a lexicon, but you also have people who are communicating with each other. And as I said before, it's a lot of things happen. The magic happens in the actual interaction. In doing fixing, interaction mean action between uh, uh, between people. And sometimes you 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 want to say something and you may not know. Okay, what is the sign? Well, there's no law against creating one on the spot. And the creativity is not just limited to the person, to the communication partner. The creativity can be in the person that we think will benefit from the, um, fr from the science. Once individuals discover or start playing the, um, the gestural um, modality, sometimes they have what, what is sometimes called in... Um, in, in sign linguistics, home signs. They create their own individual sign, but there's no law against using that if, if it's just create, if created in, an, in a natural uh, situation. Thank you so much for that to go for you. Uh, so this one actually answers one of the ones that was posted on the general channel before. Um, so we have a new one that is, um, was Jonah Gray to race player? Any signs from that game? Do we know anything about? <laughs> the only one who would know that, know that would be William, I think. Bill, yeah. you know? It's <laughs> well, I, couldn't, I couldn't quite follow your question. Would you just say that one more so, time? Someone has asked um, if John was a great charades player. And if that game influenced at all, the, some of the signs that have been included. So what kind of game? I'm sorry. Charades. Oh, charades. charades. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> yes, he was a great charades player and loved it um, and was quite good at it. And that was a big family entertainment opportunity when our, when our extended family would gather, particularly around Thanksgiving, and there would always be a charade game uh, with the whole extended family. And sometimes he used the opportunity to use the signs in the course of that. Evidently, there are a ton of charades type games in his office when we, we finally, um, you know, the team worked through cleaning us out his office. I've, I'm being told also privately on chat. So he had a, he had a, he had a stockpile of it. One of the other things I wanted to mention is um, Tracy Dooley, one of the major contributors for this work, has um, also let me know that there are over 5,000 synonyms in volume two that can help you um, kind of, if you one sign doesn't work, another sign might be better. So over 5,000 different synonyms are linked in there. Thank you, Tracy. Well, thank you so much um, to both of you as well. So if anyone wants to share any other question, I'm just going to give a brief, like five minute short break uh, and see whether like you, like the three finders would like to share with their favorite signs, some signs that you were really, yeah, attached to or would like to show the public. I know that we showed the animals and the medicine related one before, but if you have any other. And in the meantime, please do send your questions if you have more and well, one of my other favorite animal signs, Laura, is crocodile, right? <laughs> and cat and camel um, <laughs> and, you know, chicken, right? Those are, the, the animal signs are very rich and fun and especially enjoyable for kids. Well, thank you so much. Um, Nicole, do you want to? Yeah, so I have, I have some signs. You guys, you guys can't see me in my entirety, but I got I have a big pregnant belly. So the big, so baby, and then pregnant are totally appropriate for me right now. Um, I'm not going to show you my big pregnant belly because oh, it's too big. But um, that's that's the, the pregnant sign, and the baby is very appropriate. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so um, I don't think we have any more questions from the audience. Um, so. Yeah, so, uh, well, thank you so much, uh, first of the panelists, for like um, being able to join us today and to the attendees, thank you so much for making the time to, to be with us today. So, um, as Bill said before, this book is available uh, to read for free on our website in PDF format, and you have some other formats if you want to uh, purchase them as well. But the main text is available, you can access it, you can access the index, which is key, <laughs> and we should all uh, have taken that from today. And um, 
also, uh, this will be posted, um, the main panel will be posted on YouTube uh, next Monday. So if you want to like see it again, you want to share it with someone or you want to go over to some questions that we've, we've gone through and you want to try to find some answers, you can have a look at it and just also contact me if you have any further questions. So thank you so much to everyone. And uh, yeah, hope you had fun. Thanks uh, to Phil, Philip and Nicole for being with us today. Thank you.